past three months, as far as I have observed some signs of discussion and debate within the Chinese government. The Chinese government has started to um, gain some consensus, uh, a perception that the US and China relations is being positioned in a zero-sum game. Now, in this regard, it will have some very important implications of the change of Chinese foreign policy after Mr. Xi Jinping is going to step up as the president of China. Now, what would it be? I think is one of the possibility is for the Chinese government for the future, apart from continue its resource focus uh, diplomacy and economic oriented uh, diplomatic and uh, activities in the overseas, the Chinese government is going to consider to take a more assertive and more active position to try to influence the internal politics of other countries, number one. Number two, I think it's also for the Chinese government to consider to increase and to uh, consider to increase its military presence uh, in order to protect uh, the kind of national interest that it has overseas. So as you heard, China is certainly concerned over today's developments, and this comes as China itself looks to increase its presence in various parts of the Middle East. Currently, the country has its sights set on Pakistan. China already has a port in Gwadar that was built back in 2005. Last year, Pakistan asked China to build a naval base there and maintain a regular presence at the port. Now, China has denied the possibility of a naval base there, but this statement hasn't subdued fears from the U.S. and India, and the strategic importance of this port cannot be underestimated. It is quite close to the Strait of Hormuz, which is where one-fifth of the world's oil travels through, and it was the scene of a tense standoff between American and Iranian naval forces months ago after President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad threatened to shut the waterway down. And today's developments, along with China's interest in the region, shows how the chess pieces of these two global powers are slowly gravitating toward one another. We will continue to follow this story as it expands. Indian Naval Chief Admiral D.K. Joshi has stated that in case Indian economic interest in the South China Sea be threatened, it will move its naval fleet to protect it. India had signed a deal with the Vietnamese to explore oil and gas in the region. India has sparred diplomatically with China in the past over its gas and oil exploration block off the coast of Vietnam. This has been a problem for the last year, year and a half. So the Indian government uh, plans to back up its economic interests in this region uh, with the Navy because the Chinese uh, seem to think that the South China Sea, because it is named after China, belongs to them. This region has vast reserves of oil and gas and China also has disputes with the Philippines, Japan, Brunei, Malaysia and Taiwan over parts of the South Asia Sea that are reportedly claimed by them. China has claimed that it is fully within its rights to stop vessels that intrude in its waters. Given its growing economy, China is keen to explore virtually the entire mineral-rich South China Sea and has stepped up its military presence there. India is seen by the Chinese as a new entrant in its waters. Analysts say, though India and China have been working on resolving a number of outstanding issues, there seems to be marginal progress, and unless that is stepped up at the highest levels, tensions will remain. The Navy has been holding exercises to train its personnel to deal with the situation. India has been concerned with the growing might of the Chinese Navy in recent months. The Chinese in the 1980s, about 25, 30 years ago, realized that the Indian Ocean region would be a source of conflict uh, between the navies of the world and therefore it has prepared itself and is on the verge of launching its uh, offensive capability in this area and this is what we are seeing uh, is worrying most of the world. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, the South China Sea has undiscovered but proven oil reserves that are estimated to be as high as 213 million barrels. India has a stake in a gas field in the Nam Khon Son Basin of Vietnam's south coast. 
the United States of America is also planning to deploy a significant part of its naval fleet in the region in the coming months with five to six aircraft carriers. Experts believe the area could soon turn into a conflict zone with such a strong military presence. Sanjay Sethi Press TV, New Delhi. Magandang gabi po. Tila na dagdagan pa ang tensyon dulot ng agawa ng Pilipinas sa China sa ilang teritoryo. Well, America's decision to station its forces in the Philippines is part of the new off the northwestern Philippines is the site of a tense standoff between China and the Philippines over territorial claims. Vladimir Putin went to China on a two-day visit, probably amounting to around seven billion US dollars. It was really designed to create a perception of China-Russian. After eight months in office, a US president engaging with the UN like no predecessor has before. Barack Obama will address the General Assembly. He'll hold a series of meetings on the sidelines of the gathering, and he'll become the first ever US leader to chair a meeting of the Security Council. And in the Security Council, the US president chairing discussion about the rights of members to nuclear capability and issues of nuclear disarmament. Last week, 27 Americans were murdered in yet another shooting spree. 20 of those killed were children. An enormous amount of attention is being focused on this event, even to the point of having the president make emotional speeches about it and visiting the families. And it's been the top story on the news, not just in the United States, but all over the world. Obviously, this is an enormous tragedy for the families involved. However, there's something very important that's not being said here. Why is it that the American people and the world at large isn't crying for the children killed in Gaza this past month? Why is it that the women and children being killed by Obama's ongoing drone strikes aren't being talked about in the mainstream media? Why is it that the U.S. military was able to kill over a million civilians in Iraq and hundreds of thousands in Afghanistan without any outrage from the Western world? How many brown-skinned people have to die in order to merit front-page news? And why is it that some on the left are politicizing this and using it to push for new gun control laws on citizens while allowing the greatest perpetrator of mass murder in our current era the freedom to kill with impunity? 
Why aren't we hearing calls to disarm the U.S. government? Wouldn't that be more coherent? Have you forgotten that this same government that you would have disarmed the citizens is the same government that granted the military the right to imprison any civilian and execute them without trial with the NDAA? Have you forgotten that this is the same government that's been attempting to find a way to censor the internet with SOPA and PIPA? Have you forgotten that this is the same government that brutalized peaceful protesters during OWS? Do you want to give them more power? If all human life was measured with the same scale, there would have been calls to overthrow the U.S. regime a long time ago. If all human life was measured with the same scale, European governments would have imposed sanctions on the U.S. and cut off all financial ties. If all human life was measured on the same scale, you would have understood that you have a moral responsibility to stop funding those war crimes with your taxes. But all human life is not measured on an equal scale. This much is very clear. And until that changes, any talk of legal reforms is an exercise in absurdity. Later in 2002, I watched as the build-up to the invasion of Iraq occurred. It made me angry, quite frankly. It made me angry as well that Western people thought that protests were going to stop this war. I knew the invasion of Iraq was coming. I knew it was about oil, and I knew it was about setting up permanent military bases in the region. And so I initiated the Human Shield Action to Iraq. I, I argued then and I argue now that if enough of us really cared in the West, if we would have got thousands of Westerners down to Iraq and positioned ourselves at places that are supposed to be protected by the Geneva Conventions, that we could have stopped that war by making it politically untenable. And the way you make things untenable is you put Western lives in there because Western lives are not valued like Iraqi lives, Palestinian lives, and every other dark-skinned people's lives. Apparently our lives are worth more. So in that situation, in this total inequitable world that we live in, we should be using our lives to try and bolster up the rights of other people, and that was my argument then and now. Anyway, I initiated the Human Shield Action to Iraq. Thousands and thousands of people inquired. Unfortunately, it was infiltrated and subverted from the inside, but we still managed to have three double-decker buses that traveled from London to Baghdad. And there I was, the leader of the Human Shield Convoy, Human Shield Action, stuck in Italy, not able to travel to Iraq, while the rest of the convoy and the buses were heading to Baghdad. What did I do? I was forced, under duress, and it was very painful, I can tell you, to go to the American Embassy in Rome and request 